unfortunately, the world that we're living in now, where I'm sure both you and I, even when we're trying to have just a genuine scientific discussion, both of us are already aware that we're now walking in an area of landmines when mm -hmm. talking about treatment, right? And the irony is, I was bringing this up with a lot of pro-LDL folks, or I should say pro-LDL lowering folks. So I'm saying, you realize that right now, probably the best evidence for, say, statin therapy might exist in the milieu of these large metas that can better isolate the exact time for which they're most efficacious. But the problem is, is that the existing model, the existing business model, wants to wrap in everything mm -hmm. such that it actually even dilutes when the benefit is. So the NNT of being like whatever it is, 127, it's possible, and I absolutely want to be a good scientist to say, there actually might be a group that you, you narrow, narrow down and find that actually it's something more like you know 12 or 15, in which case, if that's my family member, I want them to have it at that time if they have that exact context, right? But what is the data that exists today that's taken metabolically healthy folks with high LDL and seen what the development of atherosclerosis is? Hint, hint. So far, it's ours. Yeah. <laughs> we're the only one that's looking. We're the only group that's so far looking at folks with sky high levels of LDL, but otherwise no impairment of existing metabolic health or uh, lipid, you know, things like genetic familial hypercholesterolemia, anything along those lines. And I just, I, I wish that we didn't have to be worried about the landmines around us yeah. to that's unfortunately that's and I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I think that so I started in, in clinical medicine in 1997. I became a nurse practitioner in 2000. So I was an ER nurse in inner city Baltimore, then became uh, a nurse practitioner, worked solely in cardiology for 16 years. The things that I saw evolving at that time. So we're talking late 1990s into the 2000s up until 2016. People are so afraid of being sued. Yeah. We are so afraid of being sued. I remember having conversations with my colleagues about statins in particular because I, way ahead of the curve, started kind of questioning some things. I, I was taking care of an NIH researcher who was absolutely lovely, and she was the first person who really opened up my eyes and said, you need to look at the research because I will never take a statin, and here are the five reasons why, and here's the research. And everyone kept labeling her noncompliant, noncompliant, noncompliant. And so I went and did the due diligence. And the next time she came in, I said... I can't say this, but I'm going to say this. I 100% understand what you're saying, and I applaud you for having the gumption to stand up for yourself. And I said, this is going to change how I manage and treat patients. And so I got in trouble for lowering statin doses when their total cholesterol was under 100. <laughs> Can you imagine how much sex hormones you're making <laughs> when your cholesterol, total cholesterol is under 100, and all these patients are on erectile dysfunction drugs? No wonder. No wonder or questioning why we needed to be so subversive about giving everyone a statin. I'm like, wait a minute. Then I remember the study came out before I left this cardiology group about Lipitor and the association with diabetes, especially in women. And I was told to shut my mouth. Don't talk about it. Tell them it's highly unlikely they're ever going to develop diabetes. I said, wait a minute. I'm looking at this research. I'm looking at it specifically for women. And if you're a woman and on a statin, you are much more likely to develop diabetes. And it's mechanistically, this is how it happens. And then I was told, jokingly, we used to talk, about, I used to say, we need to have, jokingly, Xanax in the water supply, because everyone was anxious. And I said that kind of jokingly. Well, that then turned into a colleague saying to me, we need to have a statin in the water supply, because no one, no one will get heart disease. And I remember thinking to myself, I was talking in the context of anxiety, and now you're talking, and you know, Xanax and benzodiazepines are not benign, but in the context of dealing with an anxious patient, and then you're talking about you'd love to have everyone on statins, because then no one would develop heart disease. And I thought to myself, I was like, this is one of many reasons I'm so tired of writing prescriptions. And one of many reasons why I left, you know, traditional allopathic medicine in 2016. So to your point, when we're talking about primary prevention, that's for those people who have not yet developed disease versus secondary prevention when I had patients who had myocardial infarctions and heart attacks and bad strokes and 
then it becomes a little bit more of a sticky wicket to have that conversation. But there are so many other drugs than just statins. And that's the thing that I think for so many people, a lot of these internal medicine individuals are still just reflexively offering only that as an option to treat lipids when there's a lot of other things that can be done, even starting with lifestyle measures. Well, it all... The default assumption should always be every intervention comes with trade-offs. We just don't know what the trade-offs are. So you want to make the proper cost-benefit analysis. Okay, so what is that for metabolically healthy people? What is the cost-benefit? I'm going to go ahead and mention something that literally came up this morning, and it's because we're on the subject anyway, so what the heck. I'll just do this. In a Facebook group, that we run. Somebody had come to ask for advice, uh, and I got their permission to share this knowing you and I were going to be chatting, but I'm anonymizing everything except for two key numbers. They were asking for advice on how to get their daughter's LDL lower. It was 137. I'm not going to say what the daughter's age is, but I, I will say that they're uh, a minor. And... Oh. And... Uh, it's because it needs to. It needs to, according to the pediatrician, be under 110. As it turns out, through conversations with others, they do this wellness check now, every year, starting at age 10. And yes, if the the lipids are part of the wellness check blood work, and if they have an LDL above 110, as in the case with this pediatrician, they're recommending that she see a cardiologist and potentially go on a statin. This is an otherwise healthy yes. child. Every, everything that they said about the child, normal BMI, uh, same thing, good HDL, good triglycerides, nothing apparently wrong save the LDL of 137. And this is, by the way, this is also one of those moments where if, if you've seen 1% of the the experiments I do that Nick Norwitz does as well, et cetera, at a minimum, at a minimum, you have to know right now just how, how dynamic lipids are. So for example, if she was on a lower carb diet, I would, I would immediately want to say, Hey, when did you get this? Where was she you in know? her cycle? If she's even got a cycle. That too. That I mean, too. Again, man brain, <laughs> right? You zeroed in on exactly what I need to start having yes. an instinct for. Um, Exactly. The, the cycle is going to make a difference as well on the lipids. And I, and I, oh man. I'm trying to, re- I'm trying to restrain myself to yeah. say what I really want to say, Dave, Yeah. about, I, about that pediatrician. First of all, an otherwise healthy preteen or teen to justify they need lab work every year, unless there's something else going on, like they've got an autoimmune condition or there's some other variable they're watching really quickly seems excessive. That's number one. Number two, I think the guidelines are that you are supposed to check a lipid panel. I don't know if it's by age five or by age 10. Have at least checked it. And that's to screen for some of those severe lipid an- anomalies that are, uh, that are inherited. Beyond that, I don't understand the utility of, first of all, checking that yearly and then to suggest to the parent that an LDL of 137 is something to worry about. It makes me wonder if this pediatrician needs to go back to medical school. No, it's a statewide policy. No. Yeah, and get this. No. According, according to the poster. I don't know any states that are doing that. I, I'm just and, curious, yeah. And, and the poster said what I probably would say as a parent, which is, hey, I as an adult can push back on my doctor. Correct. I'm scared to death of a doctor telling me what's appropriate for my child and then me pushing back and possibly getting authorities of some kind, some something involved to suggest in any way that I may not be a caring and considerate parent. I, I think I, I mean, obviously I don't, I don't, I'm not aware. I'm obviously this could be a state that I'm unaware of, but I do know in the state that I live in the great state of Virginia. Um, and I say the great state of Virginia because I love where I live. But the point I'm trying to make is that any well-meaning internal medicine doc, pediatrician, nurse practitioner, PA, would not question a parent asking why would, what would be the necessity of putting a teenager, an otherwise metabolically healthy child, 
on a drug that has profound net impact on, I mean, you think about it, uh, your, your frontal lobe is not fully developed till you're 25. I think we have to be incredibly cautious with chronic drug therapy in individuals that are still growing. And, and I, I, I guess I'm, I'm completely taken aback as a parent because I'm so careful and protective. And I'm so glad that this, this person asked this question in your group because how many other people out there would have just said, oh, okay, statin therapy lowers cholesterol and that's a good thing. But this isn't someone who conceivably is either actively in puberty clearly is not fully is not a fully formed adult yet their brains are not fully in, are not fully evolved you think about yes there's a separate cholesterol mechanism in the brain than there is in the peripheral body but we know all statins cross the blood brain barrier every one of them i mean I, I could get on a soapbox like i'm i'm trying to be restrained because i it's deeply troubling that this is becoming a policy this is exactly where i think parents need to respectfully ask for justification and make sure they are fully informed about every drug side effect because statins are not drugs that don't have side effects. And some of them are significant. We worry about the myalgias, all the muscle achiness, and yes, that's bothersome, but I worry a hell of a lot more about the neurocognitive effects of statins. Those are the things that, that, that make me nervous because I prescribed them for over 16 years. And I would say like humbly, it was, it was uh, conventional evidence-based medical therapy, and that was what I was held to. But I think about this retrospectively now, and I, I, I say, you know, no better, do better. And that's why these conversations are so important. I, um, I feel like you should just be able to just simply ask, can I see the data? Yeah. Like just that simple, right? If, if this is a new policy to get children – to consider being on statin therapy. And if it's just screening, that's one thing. Just to screen for some of the genetic lipid anomalies, right. that right. makes sense. Like I familial totally respect hyper, that. that for, for sure. Like if there's if there's genetic tests that you could find out sooner if somebody has, for example, homozygous FH, I, I'm all for that. That would be great because that, that actually is a dysfunction in lipid metabolism mm -hmm. as well as really all of your cells mm -hmm. that are nucleated with things like receptor binding and mm -hmm. so forth. That's a big deal. Yeah.